Well, hello, everybody. How you doing today? Good to see you. Welcome, everybody, on social media. Hey, we're uh, what we're doing here is we're conducting a series on lessons from the kings, lessons from the kings of the Old Testament. And so far we have covered uh, King Saul and then uh, uh, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, I think is how you say that. And then last week we started King David. Uh, I did want to say something to you about Ishbosheth. All right. Now, I, I said last week I didn't really have any lessons from him, but actually there is a lesson from him I think that we should should glean. This was Saul's son who who reigned for about two years over Israel. Judah had had David, you know, in the south. But anyway, Ishbosheth, you know, here, here's a lesson we can learn from him. He was he was put in by uh, uh, actually Abner was one of Saul's main generals. And uh, and after Saul's death, Abner had Ishbosheth put in as king. OK, he, he kind of prompted that. But but Ishbosheth was a puppet king. A, a, actually, Abner was kind of running things. But here's the thing. Ishbosheth was, was king nonetheless. And uh, but here's the thing. Ishbosheth. Now get this lesson. He accused Abner of disloyalty. That's what he accused Abner of, disloyalty. When Abner wasn't necessarily being disloyal. And what happened is, is Ishbosheth continued to accuse Abner, who wasn't necessarily being disloyal, he accused him of being disloyal. And do you know what happened in the process of time? Abner's heart was, was turned from Ishbosheth over to David. And the lesson is, is be sure you never falsely accuse someone of being disloyal to you. Because it can take someone whose heart is loyal to you and turn it away from you. So that's a good lesson to learn. I remember when I was a, 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 a young boy, I say young boy, probably 21, 22, 23, right in there, I served in a particular church. And I would stay there sometimes till 1, 1 1.30 in the morning doing the, doing the book work and getting things ready when they'd have a special pastor's meeting. You know, I'd stay there till till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and I, I would, would, would be sure that the church was ready for the next morning seminar, you know, and I'd work on the finances and recording people's offerings and, you know, because it was a big pastor's conference, you know, and for about three or four evenings, I'd stay there till, you know, late, late in the night. And then, but I had, here's the thing, I was, I, I mean, that, that's the sign of being loyal, I would think. I mean, I was doing that, I was doing it volunteer. But I had the leadership. They came to me. I remember the one time the one of the leaders came to me and said, you know, said, you know, you're just not loyal to us. Your heart's just not with us. And I thought, what? I'm staying here till I'm staying here, <laughs> stay here every night till till 12, one o'clock doing work. And, and what do you mean my heart's not with you? And so that went on. And then the next year came and and the similar thing happened. And I'm uh, and, and not just the next year, but I work throughout the year, just volunteering, 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 doing whatever I could to help that church be a success. But again and again, the leadership of that church would say, you know, well, yeah, you're doing an OK job here, doing a good job, but your heart's just not with us. Now, listen, my heart was with them. But when I was falsely accused for so long of my heart not being there, guess what happened to my heart? It began to turn away, not in an evil way or a bad way, but it began to or not again. It didn't turn against those people, but it began to turn away from those people into a different direction. So what we need to realize here is, is don't ever falsely accuse somebody of disloyalty when they're not being disloyal. OK, that's a lesson from Ish. Bo Sheth, okay, all right. So, so there's a lesson. Now, another. So let's. Let, anyway, I just, I, I, I just thought that would be helpful. All right. Now let's uh, let's pick back up with David. Look at Acts thirteen verse twenty two. Acts thirteen verse twenty two. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart. And if you want to be a person after God's own heart, listen to look at this verse. Acts thirteen twenty two. And when he had removed him, he raised up. Uh, for them, David is king. 
So he's talking about when Saul had been removed, God raised up for the people, David is king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Now, why was he a man after his, God's own heart? Who, who, who what? Who will do what? All my will. See, if you want to be a person after God's own heart, you need to do all of the will of God. Remember, Saul got in trouble with God because he, he just did a part of what God wanted done. Now, let me tell you something about David. David was not perfect. He was anything but. But his heart, his heart remained right towards the Lord. And so, remember, a man looks on the outward, but God looks at the heart, okay? And so, just remember, if you want to be a person after... Uh, uh, God's own heart, just do all of his will and, uh, and, and that'll be a good thing. You don't have to be perfect, you know, but, you know, because none of us are, but do your best to keep your heart right before the Lord, okay? And, uh, and, and so David, he did the will of the Lord. He wasn't perfect, but he, he always kept that heart right before God, okay? Uh, as best as he could. Now, uh, another lesson and I'm not going to have you turn here, but in 2 Samuel 23, if you're taking notes, you can read this later. This is a very interesting lesson we can learn from David. There came a time in his life where, uh, have you ever been at a place where, where maybe you got hungry and you said, oh boy, I'd like to have a, I mean, I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell Diane, I'll say, you know, I'd like to have some, some, some shrimp from, uh, where's that place up in Crestwood we go? Uh, Red Lobster. I'd like to have some of their Waltz shrimp. You know, oh, I'd like some of that, you know. Have you ever had that, you know, or you, or you had a milkshake somewhere from a certain, you know, like Ted Drew's or whatever it is. And in a hot day, you say, oh, boy, I, I, I would love to have a milkshake from Ted Drew's. Well, I tell you what, there was a time when David had longing. He had a longing for something. He said, oh, that I could drink uh, uh, some water from the well of Jerusalem that was over by the gate. Because see, uh, not in Jerusalem, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. See, he grew up in Bethlehem. David uh, was from Bethlehem. It's, uh, Bethlehem's the, the, the city of David. And he said, oh, that I could get a, 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 a drink of water from the well in Bethlehem that's over by the gate. And you know what? Some of his men heard that. And guess what they did? They, they loved David so much, they went to Bethlehem, who at that time was, was, uh, had the Philistines there. But his men broke through the Philistine lines, snuck in there, went to that well in Bethlehem over by the, over by the, the, the gate and got him some water. And they brought it back to David. Now, those are some pretty good men to have, you know. And you know what? When they brought that, now here's the lesson. When they brought that, water to David, guess what he didn't do? He didn't drink it, but he offered it to the Lord and poured it out before the Lord as an offering. What lesson do we learn there? We learn there to honor the sacrifices that others make for us. Learn to honor the sacrifices that, other, that others make for us. Okay? Learn to honor, because that's what David did. David didn't say, oh, well, great, boy, I got this water. I mean, I mean he, he, he didn't do that. It was so holy to him. He's so honored, because see, his men put their lives in danger to get that water. And uh, he, he honored that so much that uh, he wouldn't drink the water, but he offered it and he poured it out before the Lord as, as, as an offering. So learn to honor the sacrifices of others. And then another lesson that we learned from David is David had numbered the people. He shouldn't have done that. And, and so the judgment of God was going to come. And God gave him three choices of how, how, how the judgment was going to come. So David chose the choice where there'd be a plague in the land for three days. OK, so I'm not going to go through all of that. But what happened was in the process of time, uh, Gad, the prophet, came to David and said, go up to this certain uh, uh, threshing floor and make an offering to the Lord. And as a result, the plague was going to come to an end. And so David went, as the prophet said, up to the, to, to the threshing floor. And when he got there, the man who owned the threshing floor said to David, and I'm just paraphrasing, put it, putting this in my own words for the sake of time. You can read this in 2 Samuel 24. But, but the guy that owned the threshing floor said to David, said this, said, say, he said, hey, 
you can have the threshing floor and hey, I've got some livestock here. You can have the livestock also to offer offerings to the Lord. And, you know, David made this statement. He said, and just paraphrasing it, he said, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. He said, I'm going to buy this from you first before I offer to the Lord. Now, you think about that. And he went on to say this. He said this. He said he, he said to this guy, he said, because because this guy, his name was Aurora, 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 however you say it. A-R-A-U, Aruna, Arana, I don't know. I'm not, uh, it, it's A-R-A-U-N-A-H, Aruna, Arana, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just glad I'm not named that. But uh, <laughs> my wife would have trouble saying it. How did I have trouble saying it? But anyway, David said, he said, he, he said to this guy, this Jebusite, he said, I'm not going to take this threshing floor. I'm not going to take the livestock. I'm going to pay you for them before I offer sacrifice. And he said this, he said to the guy, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, now watch this, with that which costs me nothing. And there's a great lesson to learn about giving offerings to the Lord. Never offer anything to God of that which costs you nothing. That's a good lesson to learn. Uh, let me say it another way. Don't ever give God your junk. You understand that? I've watched this in pastoring over the many years. You know, we'll, we'll be going to be giving stuff to the poor and folks will start bringing their junk. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with giving a lightly used coat or, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's amazing how people will, will bring, you know, bring clothing items that just got big tears in them and big rips in them. How many of you know there's a difference between a coat with a big rip in it and a coat that's just been worn a couple of times, you know? And I watch people bring their junk to God. And, I, and it's nothing new. You can go to the book of Malachi and you can read where they brought their, the livestock to offer and they were crippled and, 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 and lame and blind. And, you know, you know, don't ever give junk to the Lord. You understand that? Don't, don't ever give God that which cost you nothing. And so that's a lesson that we learned from David in 2 Samuel 24. And then another lesson we learned from him is in 1 Samuel 30, in 1 Samuel 30, uh, when, when, when Ziklag, remember Ziklag got, uh, got, um, the Amalekites came in there and invaded and all of that and took, took David and his men's wives and children and, and kidnapped them and all of that. Remember that? And David and his men came back and found that, that their wives and children had been taken and all of that. Remember? And, and, and the, the, the people, David's men and the people were even coming against him and, and they'd wept and David had wept so much he didn't have any more to weep and he was really down. Have you ever been down? I mean, he, he was, David was down low. But you know what? He, the Bible says, it's in, it's in 1 Samuel 30, you can read it in, in verse 6. The Bible said David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so here's a good lesson to learn is learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord because you won't always have your pastor nearby to encourage you. You won't always have friends and family nearby to encourage you. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes your friends and family can be more of a discouragement than an encouragement. You, you understand that. Now, a lot of times they do encourage, but, but the thing you need to learn about David is learn to encourage yourself in the Lord, because David, he didn't have anybody around to encourage him. So he learned to encourage himself. OK. And uh, remember, David was the uh, psalmist. He he's known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. And uh, so if you ever get down and low, what you do is go over to the book of Psalms and start reading the Psalms and, and let those Psalms encourage you. So David, he learned to encourage himself in the Lord. But of all the lessons we could cover as it pertains to David, I think perhaps one of the, the best lessons would be found in 2 Samuel 11. So let's turn over there to 2 Samuel 11. And, and it's, it's, it's the story of David and his encounter with Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And we can learn so much from this. And let's learn from David uh, and so that we don't make the same mistakes he made. OK, because we're going to see that he uh, committed adultery with this lady 
And, uh, and so we're going to point some things out here that I think will be helpful to you. So let's, you know, it's better to learn from somebody else's life than to go to, than to have to go through a, a, a heartache yourself. You, you understand? And so here in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, now this first verse, you ought to highlight this, underline it, put stars around it. Very important. It, and most people overread it. They just read right over it and don't catch it. But it happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go out to battle, and it goes on to say David remained at Jerusalem. Now, now David was the king, and where was David supposed to be? He was supposed to be at the battle. He was supposed to be out to battle, but he stayed in Jerusalem. He was somewhere he shouldn't have been. He was supposed to be out in the battle. Okay? But he was in Jerusalem. He was somewhere that he shouldn't have been in the first place. And notice verse 2, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now see, if he'd have been out in the battlefield, guess what? He wouldn't have been here looking at this woman. Is that right? And so, so he was, and actually, you know, uh, and she was very beautiful. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Well, uh, now this isn't good. It's not good. And uh, someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of, of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? I mean, now she's somebody's wife. Everything. I mean, first of all, this should have never happened. Why? Because David was supposed to be where? Out on the battlefield, right? See, when lesson we learn, when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, we can find ourselves in positions where the devil will be able to tempt us. Do you get that? If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, we can find ourselves in situations where the devil will be able to tempt us. And if David had been out on the battlefield, he wouldn't have been here to see Bathsheba. You understand that? So be sure that you find out from God what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be and always be there doing that. And I tell you what, it, it, will, it will limit the devil's opportunities to tempting you. Okay. So nonetheless, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And, uh, and, and, and he, he, he was walking around there. I, I suspect he was bored. You know, when you're when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you can wind up being bored. You get bored. You can get into all kinds of mischief. You understand that. And that's what happened here. And then he's looking at something he shouldn't have been looking at, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, I said he was looking at something he shouldn't have been looking at. Right. So back there then they didn't have computers. So but they did have rooftops. They didn't have mouses to click, but they did have rooftops. And so I guess you could say he was he was uh, he 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 shouldn't have been he shouldn't have been looking at what he was looking at. OK, I mean, now he walked out on that rooftop and he looked and he saw. I mean, right there. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty innocent right there when he gives that first look. But I tell you what, that second look is where you get in trouble. You see, I said it's that second look. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about? A pretty woman walks by, you notice it's a beautiful woman, okay. But it's, it's when, you, when you give that second look, I mean, that's where, where you get in trouble, you know. I said, that's where you get in trouble. And so he calls for her, and, uh, and, and he, he inquires of her, finds out that she's married. And then verse 4, it just keeps getting worse here. He sends messengers and took her, and she came to him, and they had sex. Now you think about that. Now she's, yeah, I mean, she's a married woman. He's a married man. This is what we call, this is what we call, this is what's called adultery. Adultery is a heinous sin, dear friends. It's a heinous sin. I said it's a heinous sin because it doesn't just affect the two people that are having sex outside of wedlock, but it affects their spouses and children and it just causes a M-E-S-S. -S. You know what that spells? Mess. It causes a mess. It doesn't just hurt the two, but it, that, that they're doing the sin, but it hurts their spouses and their children, as we'll see. It, it can wreak havoc in, 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 in people's lives. And by the way, let me say something else here, too. Uh, you know, uh, 
uh, it take, what's that old saying? It takes two to tango. You know, uh, Bathsheba should have cut him off. She should have cut him off and not went up there. Why? Because she's married. Now, now he is the king. And so I don't know how the protocol was back there. I mean, he's the king and, 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 and all of that. But I tell you what, uh, I don't care if he's the king, the president, or who he is. She's a married woman. She's got to say what? She's got to say no. She's got to cut it off. So we, I mean, David shouldn't have done what he did, but that whole thing could have ended if Bathsheba would have said no. You understand that? And I've watched uh, couples over the many, many, many years. Uh, I've watched adultery. I've watched people get into adulterous situations and all of that. But I tell you what, if a man has flirting eyes... I tell you what, if the, woman's, if the woman he's flirting with will not cooperate, that thing ends right there. And vice versa. You know, if, if, if a man, or if, if somebody's flirting with a woman and the woman won't have nothing to do with the man, it ends right there. If a woman's flirting with a man and the man won't have anything to do with the woman, the thing ends right there. It takes two. You got to flirt back. I said you got to flirt back. And that's where the trouble comes in. I am so thankful for my wife. One thing that I wanted, that I said to the Lord, I said, I said, I want some, I want, I want a pretty wife, and He gave me a pretty wife. And I said, I want, I want a wife that is, uh, 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 is, is, is going to love me as much as I love her, and she does. And I wanted one that was faithful, and she is. And I've watched my wife's very beautiful, and I've watched men over the years, not not in the church setting, but just here and there. I've, I've watched them try to flirt with her. And I mean, you know what? They're going nowhere fast with her. And it blesses me so. I said it blesses me so. And any man starts flirting with my wife too far. I mean, I, I don't even have to get involved. She's going to take a baseball bat and start beating him over the head. She don't want to. I mean, I, I mean because you're not going anywhere with my wife because she's loyal and faithful to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm the same way back to her. I've got the best, can't get any better than her. So I'm not, you know, I'm not interested. But I tell you what, it takes two. What is it? Takes two to tango. And so, so I've watched it over the years where folks start flirting with somebody and they start flirting back. I tell you what, you wind up, you wind up in a mess. You wind up in the bed of adultery. Because remember, you, you don't start out in the bed of adultery. You wind up in the bed of adultery. Where does the bed of adultery start? It starts out with the flirting. It starts out with sending a little text and two people start texting. I, I'm talking about a man and a woman who, don't, who aren't a husband and a wife. I tell you what, if you text, if, if you're a man out there listening and you're married and you start, ha you have to text another woman, maybe it's whatever the case, be sure you always include your wife in on that text. Amen. And vice versa. And always, you know, my wife can come look at my phone anytime she wants and I can look at her phone anytime I want. We don't have anything to hide. But I tell you what, you do need to make safeguards. I know my wife, she will not be around the member of the opposite sex unless I'm there. And I won't be around the member of an, op the member of an opposite sex unless she's there. That's just good, isn't it? I said, that's just good, isn't it? I'm not going to be getting into any kind of extended text or telephone conversations, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, I might have to call and talk to a female or she might have to call and talk to a male to set something up or whatever. But but once once you get past that, there's not going to be any extended uh, me talking to females or her talking to males because we, we, we put safeguards in so these things can't happen like what happened to, to David and Bathsheba. Now, I trust my wife. She trusts me. But we still have flesh. And we the Bible says, give no place to the devil. Is that right? The Bible says make no provision for the flesh. The Bible says avoid the very appearance of evil. So there's some things that married people need to do. Put safeguards, not, not that you don't trust your spouse, not that you don't trust yourself or anything like that. But I tell you, we all have flesh. And uh, I remember when we were sitting at Bible school, uh, uh, I, I was sitting there one day and there was a teacher up teaching and uh and, and he was teaching about safeguarding your marriage. And I was sitting there and he was talking about doing different things, you know, that you can safeguard your marriage. And I had this thought. I said, I could never be tempted in that area because I love my wife so much. I could never be tempted in that area. And no more than I said that, he said, and if you think you can't be tempted in that area, there's hundreds of people there. He said, if you don't think you can be tempted in that area, you're next on the devil's hit list. And I just wanted to duck, you know, I thought, my goodness. But you see, we all have flesh. 
And as loyal as you are to your spouse and, and, and all of that, and as faithful as you are, you still need to put safeguards in because remember the Apostle Paul, he said that, he said, I know in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. So we don't want to make any provision for the flesh, you see. Can you say amen to that? Absolutely. And, uh, but anyway, but David messed up and he got into it. He got into adultery here. And, uh, and, and, and then now let's go on here. What happened is, is he finds out that now, now she's with child. I mean, now, so he gets her pregnant. Now that's something, ain't it? He gets her pregnant. So you see things just keep getting more compounded and he gets her pregnant. And, uh, then he finds out that, that her husband is Uriah. Now, Uriah was a soldier, and this soldier was loyal to David. Very loyal to David. And so David has him called in, and he tries to get Uriah to go have sex with Bathsheba. And then, you know, because now David knows she's pregnant, right? So now let's get Uriah to come in and have sex with her. And back there in that day, they didn't have the DNA testing like we have now. So let's have Uriah go in and have sex with her, and everybody will think it's Uriah's child. But guess what? Uriah was so honorable, he said, I'm not going to go in and have sex with my wife when, when my fellow soldiers are out there on a battlefield. Now, that's pretty honorable, isn't it? So then guess what? David, tried, David actually gets, it, gets him drunk. Now, David wasn't perfect. Man after God's own heart got Uriah drunk and said, because he couldn't get him to go sleep with his, own, with his own wife any other way. So he got him drunk and said, now go in and have sex with her, with her. And he still wouldn't do it. Now, that's something, isn't it? And so when none of that worked, guess what? David ordered that Uriah go back to the battlefield and be put on the front lines of the hottest battle. And in the midst of that battle, the rest of the troops were ordered to withdraw. And guess what? Uriah was killed. So David not only committed adultery, but he also was accessory to murder. And God actually saw it as murder that, that David had Uriah murdered. And then on top of all of that, David covers it all up. This is bad. This is really bad. I mean, this is, wouldn't you say this is really bad? If you think this is really bad, shake your head and, okay, it's really bad. How many really thinks it's bad? I mean, it's bad stuff. And, uh, in, in 2 Samuel 11, verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. See, when we think nobody else knows, guess what? Somebody knows. Who, who knows? God knows. And here in 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, is something that we see God's method of operation. God is so good. Then the Lord sent Nathan, who was a prophet. He sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. And that's something really good about God. He loves us so much that when we get off, he'll send, he'll send people our way to straighten us out, get us back on track. And so he sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. And he pointed out his sin. He told him that parable of the ewe lamb, you know, how that, you know, there was a rich man and a poor man and a traveler came to the rich man asking for, uh, for food. And the rich man didn't uh, kill one of his vast numbers of livestock. He took that poor man's little ewe lamb and killed. Remember that? Killed that one little lamb. And remember when David heard that, he got so angry as this parable was being told to him. And, and, and he said the rich, listen, to this, he said the rich man should die. And the poor man should be repaid fourfold. Now, a lot of people read over all that and, and they miss the forest for the trees. I, I don't want to miss the forest for the trees. David said out of his own mouth, did you know God will judge you a lot of times right out of your own mouth? And he said that man that, that, that had that rich man that had that little ewe lamb or the poor man that had, had that little lamb killed. He said that rich man should die and the poor man should be recompensed fourfold. Now, it's interesting. As you read on down, 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. So he pointed out his sin. He said, you're the man. 
And, and thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite. See, God saw... He, he killed, God saw it as David did it. You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Wow. Now therefore the sword, now watch this, the sword will never depart from your house because you've despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I'll raise up adversity against you from your own house. I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did this secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. My, 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 my. See, it, it, it's not, the sin's not worth it. And by the way, is a biblical principle, whatever you're doing in secret, eventually it'll come out openly. Eventually. There's a verse that says, you're, be sure your sin, he said, be sure to know your sin will find you out. But here's the thing. David was quick to repent. Now, if you're taking notes, uh, learn a lesson from David. If you do miss it, if you do sin, be quick to repent. Be quick to repent. Be quick to repent. And notice verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Notice he didn't make a bunch of excuses. He just said, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to, the, to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. And then watch this. He said, you'll not die. Now think about this. What did David say that that rich man should, what it should have happened to him that he should have died Guess what? David was, was not too short from dying here. He was not too far away from dying. Now, it's not a matter of him going to hell. David was not going to go to hell. He loved the Lord. He just had sin. He had a grievous sin in his life here. And it was going to cost him his life. And God was going to judge him out of his own mouth. But guess what? David repented. Isn't it good to know that we can repent? And he repented and he didn't blame it. Look at this. He didn't blame his sin. He didn't blame it on Bathsheba. He didn't blame it on Uriah. He didn't blame it on this. He didn't blame it on that. He blamed it on himself. He said, I have sinned. And just that quick, he, <laughs> notice, the Lord has put away your sin. Isn't that good news? That's good news. You'll not die. That's really good news. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, we read in 2 Samuel 12, 13, I, I have sinned against the Lord. But if you want to see David's real heart here, and, and I'll do this as quickly as I can, but go to Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51. I've sinned against the Lord. We see that. But if you want to get the full scope, let, let me just take a few minutes with this. If you want to get the full scope of David's heart, read Psalm 51 because that's the psalm he wrote in response to this. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See how he's taking ownership of it? For I acknowledge my transgression. See, he acknowledged that he sinned. He confessed it with a repentant heart. He said, my sin's always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. See, he wasn't blaming anybody else. And then look at verse 7. He said, purge me with hyssop. And if you study into that word hyssop, it was a plant that was used to apply blood. And uh, uh, like it was used in Egypt when they applied the blood to the doorpost and the altar. And if you study into it, it, it points to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a type of it. it. It pointed to it. And what David was really saying is, is cleanse me with, with your precious blood. Glory to God. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. It can forgive all sin. He said, for, he said, purge me with hyssop, I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me uh, hear joy and gladness that the bones you have uh, broken may rejoice. Hide your face uh, not, uh, he said, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do, now watch this. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. See, he had seen the Holy Spirit depart from Saul and he didn't want it to depart from him. 
Because he saw what a mess Saul became when the Holy Ghost left Saul. He didn't want that to happen to him. He said, restore to me the joy. See, he didn't lose his salvation, but he lost the joy of salvation. See, when you've got sin in your life, when a Christian has sin in their life, it's not, it's not a matter of losing their salvation, but it's a matter of, of there's not going to be any joy. Has anybody ever missed it beside me? And, and, and it's not a matter that, that when I missed it, I lost my salvation, but I lost the joy of my salvation. And David had lost the joy of his salvation. And he said, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then verse 14, he says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness, O Lord, upon my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do, now watch this, learn a lesson here. You do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Now, now wait a minute. Now listen, God did desire sacrifice and he did delight in burnt offerings, but David is saying this from his perspective. Because watch this, he's saying to God, he says, you, you, he said, you don't desire sacrifice or else I would give it. See, David had a lot of, a lot of livestock out there. He could have went out and killed some lambs and offered. But his heart, see, if he'd have done that before he repented, his heart, his heart was not right. And if he'd have just went out there and killed some, some, some lambs, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been pleasing to God. See, he, God, let's read on here. See, he says in verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you'll not despise. Look at verse 19. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, a whole burnt offering and so on. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. What is he telling us here? That if it, it, after he sinned, if he would have just went out and killed some, some lambs or some livestock and offered, God wouldn't have been pleased with that. Because there was sin in his life. But, but once he repented of the sin, then if he offers these livestock, then God would be pleased with it. And so what I, a lesson we can learn, you know, and I've watched Christians do this for years and years and years. They'll bring tithes and offerings to the house of God, but there's sin in their life. Things in their life that should not be there. Gossiping, backbiting, all kinds of things. And they'll bring their tithes and their offerings and they'll put their tithes and offerings in the, in the offering basket. But if there's sin in your life, those tithes and offerings aren't pleasing to the Lord. Get the sin out, repent of the sin, confess your sins before God. If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9 says, and then come and offer your sacrifice. Jesus made the statement. He said, you come and bring your offering and you've got aught in your heart against your brother. He said, he said, leave your leave your offering at the altar. Go make it right with your brother and then come back and offer offer your gift. So what, what does this teach us? What lesson do we learn here is that don't give offerings to God if there's sin in your heart. Uh, get, get, what does the Bible say? What is what is uh, what is a blessing to God? What blesses him is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite, repentant heart. Then get things right. Then go offer the sacrifice. Can you say amen? Now, we're, let me close this up. Second Samuel 12, verse 14. We learn something else. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Now you ought to underline that. A lot of times people read over that. But you know what? What David did is he gave an occasion to the enemies to blaspheme the Lord. I, I, just think about this. Uh, I, have you ever heard where there's like a big minister who's known nationally? And he commits sin. He gets into adultery. We had this back in the 80s. This happened here in the United States. And, and there were a couple of big ministers back there that messed up sexually. They were television, televangelists. They were known throughout the country. And they messed up sexually in, in adultery. Remember that? And, and what, what, what do you then hear sinners saying? They start talking bad about God because those preachers messed up. And those preachers gave those sinners and others, you know, uh, 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 and, and Christians alike, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about, reason to talk bad about the Lord because those preachers messed up. And I had to learn this lesson. Just because a preacher messed up doesn't mean God's messed up. Can you say amen to that? 
But you see, when we as Christians, and it's true of you and me, if, if people are watching us, they know we're saved. They know we love the Lord. And our family members, others, they watch us. And if we mess up and sin in front of them, then what does it do? It gives them occasion to talk bad about God because they think God is like, like us when, when we miss it, you see. You understand that? So let's don't give, let's don't give any, let's don't mess up so that we don't give people that don't love the Lord occasion to think bad of him. Can you say amen to that? And that's what happened here. And then he went on here and he said, he said, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. That, that little baby that uh, uh, Bathsheba was pregnant with, that it was a, it was a boy. And the prophet here said that your son's going to die. Don't tell me that that it doesn't that don't tell me the wages of sin is not death. See, David was spared, but his baby is going to die. And uh, actually, remember when he said about that ewe lamb? Remember, he said you'll pay. He said he said the rich man needs to be put to death, and uh, and 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 the poor man needs to be recompensed fourfold. Remember that. And if you study David's life, if you study his life, and here's a lesson to learn: God will judge us out of our own mouth. Uh, David had to pay fourfold, if you study his life, he had to pay fourfold. There were four major calamities that took place within his family after this. One was the death of that little baby. Number two, Amnon, who was one of David's sons, raped Tamar, who was one of David's daughters. So he raped his half-sister and there was incest. Number three, Absalom, OK, who was one of David's son and Tamar's full brother had his brother Amnon, who was David's son, murdered because of the rape. And then fourth, finally, Absalom, David's son, revolted against David later on down the line and uh, was was somewhat successful, but only short lived and eventually was killed. You see, David said fourfold recompense. Fourfold. Be real watchful how quick you are to judge others. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. Because a lot of times God will judge you right back, right out of your own mouth. And David was getting ready to die, but he repented. But he lost his son. And there are four things. The loss of his baby. A rape took place. A murder took place right within his family. And then his son rebelled. Isn't that something? But you know what? That little baby died, but eventually David and Bathsheba had another son. Does anybody know his name? It starts with an S. Had Solomon. And here's a lesson to learn. Out of something very bad, God can bring something very good. So even though they lost that little baby, Solomon came along and something out. God can take something very bad and from it bring something very good. David lived until he was 70. 70, 71, right in there. And uh, he chose Solomon to succeed him, which we'll get to Solomon next week. Fantastic lessons with Solomon. David is known as the greatest of the kings of Israel, the standard by which the others are judged. And David taught us many lessons, but I think maybe perhaps the best lesson he taught us as we all stand. And they're going to put this up on the screen. The best lesson that he taught us, I think, is found in Psalm 23. And I'm going to read it. and You can read it along with me if you like. Does anybody know Psalm 23? Y'all know how to stand, don't you? Let's everybody stand. Let's stand in the presence of God just right before we close. The greatest lesson that, we've, that we could learn from David, perhaps at the top of the list, is found in Psalm 23. And let's just read it. Let's just read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you're out there and you're watching online and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, if he's not your shepherd, then call on his name. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. So with a repentant heart, call on his name. You'll be saved. You'll miss hell 
You'll make heaven and he'll make your life worth living in the meantime. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you. Bye-bye.